Hello, you're very welcome to this Redline Book Festival in conversation with Debbie Deegan from Two Children with Love. We're about to talk to Debbie, who's here with me uh, in a few minutes. But first, I want to show the few people of you that don't know who Debbie is a little bit more about her. Those children in that orphanage gave us their hearts. They trusted us with their futures. They changed their lives. They changed our lives. And I'm hoping that today their story might just touch your life. For over 20 years, Debbie Deacon has been changing the lives of some of the most vulnerable and deprived children in the orphanages of Russia. Debbie has built and sustained a charity organisation that has raised millions of euros and drastically helped in the lives of thousands of children. More recently, Debbie has also co-founded a life-changing scholarship in Ireland for children with many challenges in their lives. Over the years, Debbie has worked tirelessly and dedicated her life to improving the lives of the children in Russian orphanages. She has become a media personality and has spoken in front of hundreds of thousands of people. I love to talk and um, I love to talk to young minds when I think that they're learning and they want to make a difference and they want to change our world because it needs to be changed. Love more serious talks about really about leadership and team building and human connectivity. They're some of my favourite things to talk about because I see where the, the failings are. Debbie's work has been recognised with many awards and accolades over the years. Most recently, Debbie was awarded the Russian Order of Friendship by Vladimir Putin, the highest honour available to a Westerner in Russia. Debbie Deegan sat down with a man for two hours at an event in which he honoured her with one of the highest awards given in Russia, and she's here. He wanted to introduce me to the man who was going to be sitting to my right. I looked up, and looking down at me was the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. Suddenly, the Pope was a very small problem. <laughs> I listened to your promises and I hope that all of the promises are fulfilled. I knew I wouldn't have another opportunity to probably talk to him again. I did say to him that I'd like to be with him when he closes the last gate in the last orphanage because orphanages are bad places for children. I think we've changed the way the people we work with uh, actually think about children. Um, and that's been a huge thing for me that I was able to make such a change in such a difficult environment. When I did my TED talk, I finished up with a question at the end, which was like, what is the one thing you can do to make this world a kinder place? And I really genuinely believe that that's a very good question. Everybody needs to ask themselves. I would like to get our message out there on a broader scale because we've achieved an incredible amount in Russia when everybody else just can't take any more and they just, they're exhausted and they're burned out or whatever. Um, I just won't give up. Debbie, I've always been a fan of the phrase, folly that, right? <laughs> and I'm just wondering how I folly that. <laughs> Amazing video about your work and your life and what you have done. But uh, where this conversation started between me and the Redline Book Festival was around Russia with Love, which is your book, uh, your second book, which is the children's stories of Russia. And at the start of that book, you bring people through a very, very brief history of where this all started. So can you bring me back to Clontarf and to finding out about something called Chernobyl children and then a decision that you made to maybe welcome people into your home and go from there? So we were, um, well, first of all, nice to sit and chat to you and tell you the story because I do love telling the story and it's a story that should be told really. Um, so yeah, 1998, 1997, um, a lot of children come into Ireland, a couple of thousand children come into Ireland following the Chernobyl catastrophe. Sure. Um, and they were looking for homes for them. And we had a spare bedroom and I just thought it would be a nice thing to do. Totally uh, naive about that whole world. Had a, don't mean a romantic notion about orphanages, but they were not something that were, you know, I'd, I didn't know anything about them. They were something kind of, you read about in a children's book. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we went to the airport and we collected um, two little girls and um, they came to stay and you know, we got the pink nighties and the pink fluffy slippers and the, we did the whole over the top Western thing that you do ridiculously and because uh, they've come from a different world altogether, which I had no knowledge of at this point. Sure. And um, to make a very long, complicated story short, um, 
uh, both little girls ended up going back to Russia uh, for different uh, at, at the end of the holiday and rest and recuperation they officially call it. Right. And um, they say that a month in Ireland gives them you know fresh air, fresh. They run into the sea. They do stuff that they never normally do. And um, and they get hugged and loved and kissed and doted on by Irish families. And um, the horror part of that is that they have to go back, you know. And that didn't at the end of the their duration with me. I wasn't really prepared to let that happen. Um, and so one stayed because she was ill with meningitis, and one went back. And then a year later, I went to Russia to find the second child. Um, There's a, a story you tell in the book of how when you were driving them from the uh, airport, one of the little girls tapped your husband on the shoulder. Yes. And said, Dada. Yes. And that was probably the start of a very long relationship, you know, because he you're stunned when that happens with the child because they had little badges on their jumpers that said orphan and their name and their age, like six, age seven. And you're looking at this little scrawled word, orphan, name, age. And you're kind of thinking, is this real? Have they been dropped out of a Victorian book? Hmm. Um, Because I wasn't familiar with that world at all. I wasn't in that zone at all. Um, so yeah, it has a big impact when you started to, when we started to think as a family. Well, they've nobody. They've never had when we listened to their own stories and they'd never had a visitor in seven or eight years that they were living in the orphanages. And I kind of thought, well, that's not really the way. If we can change it, we'll change it. Sure. You know. And you went to Russia as a Westerner, as yes. we are, um, to visit an orphanage. And can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because uh, the imagery in the book, and I'm going to be referring to the book a lot, obviously, yeah, for this okay. conversation, yeah. or at least the start of it. The imagery in the book is one of um, dark forests and long roads. Yeah. Have you been, Dara? I haven't. No. Okay. You'll have to go at some right. point because it's an extraordinary country to see. I mean, in every way, visually, the culture, their appreciation for literature, which really I have very little, to be honest with you, but their overwhelming um, sense of culture and tradition and all that. And uh, so to get off, we actually flew to Minsk, um, two of us, a girlfriend of mine and myself went and we were looking for this orphanage in the middle of, and we, at the time, Putin had just um, arrived. So him and me arrived at the same time. We're unknowns to each other. And um, so this terrifying creature was up in, like, as I always kind of, I think I described in one of the books, it was like the Wizard of Oz, you know, up there in that castle that everybody is terrified of. And he's this big creature that his picture's on every single wall in every single office, no matter where you go. And like, if you didn't have a picture of him on the wall, you soon would, you know. Um, but I stayed away from him. I wasn't interested in, and he and he inherited a, a, a massive problem um, following the the crash of communism and all of that mess that was happened in Russia at the time. And there was a crash in the econ- their economy in 1998. People hadn't been paid in about six or seven months, which I wasn't aware of because I wasn't tuned into Russian business. And um, so when we got off the plane, it was like, it was maybe minus 25. Um, and it was uh, the end of autumn. And I didn't know that you could drive for seven hours and not see a light. You know, like literally to drive for seven or eight hours through and only see the one uh, silver birch trees. So the roads in Russia are completely lined by silver birch trees, which are which pick which reflect, you know, the way of a white bark. And so you have this magnificent white tree trunks and covered in dense, frosty snow white snow and the sky is really really high over there I think because the country is so big our sky never feels as high here there's obviously a reason for that and uh, so when I stepped out of the car like at midnight I think it was and I looked up and you just see like billions of stars that you don't really see here um it's a different experience completely and the snow being so deep um the whole thing was like something out of a fairy story in really in a way it was like stepping into a children's book um and then of course the next day um we eventually arrived at the gates of our orphanage and uh i had never been to one before so it was they keep orphanages out of really out of people's eye line a bit like ireland did as well say with um you know these places the laundries and the ma- all all baby homes and all they're that, kind yeah. of not in the middle of your cities sure. you know and um so at the time putin um had inherited uh, about eight hundred thousand orphans um, mostly, I'd say at the time, about 70% of them were social orphans, similar to Irish ones, actually. They did have parents, the same as Irish ones would have had. But they were for poverty, alcohol, whatever it was. 
um, they, for one reason or another, the, 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 the institutions were packing up with these people. In general, it was alcohol, because after communism, people didn't really understand how that they how they were going to work to earn a living, and um, so it was just easier to get hammered uh, on on rocket fuel because the vodka that they would drink at that at then. And uh, so I didn't really know any of this. I I was just went in with the kind of rosy notion that I was going to find this lovely place and there'd be lovely children running around. And when you put we, we pushed in rusty old gates, and uh, it was like ramshackly. I mean, it was it was Dickensian, and um, it was the, like there was a sea of children, a sea of faces staring at us, um, untrusting, completely untrusting, because people come in and out of their lives quite a lot come once and they never see them again. Um, a lot of people came with Bibles uh, trying to convert and all that kind of stuff. And so they'd see them for a day. They might get a bracelet off the person and maybe a Bible and they'd be gone again. There was a lot of that going on at the time because Russia was open to that kind of at the time because the, it had all crashed. Nice. And then Putin got, the, got his, uh, his hands on, on the whole situation. Um, so I was overwhelmed by the whole thing to the point where I kind of thought, you know, Really, I felt, I really did feel, I read in a book recently that Elizabeth Gilbert wrote um, called, um, called The Big Magic. And she describes in the book, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she describes in, in this book called The Big Magic where something, an opportunity kind of comes towards you and some people grab it and some people just let it pass them. And so in life, different things, grab some people and don't grab other people. And I felt with that, and for me, it was like a, it was like this life altering moment mm -hmm. um and i just felt i was totally immersed in th all of these children that it started at age six and went up to about 18 and i mean the ones that were 18 were fierce looking like you wouldn't look at them crooked walking past them i mean they were fierce no teeth t uh, self tattooed with these inky blue marks um i mean they were fierce they had been institutionalized all their lives you'd be afraid to look at them and the small ones i felt were totally vulnerable and um, I just, I was stayed for three or four days and did the whole ridiculous Western thing of, you know, face painting and sweets and balloons and thought, now that's it. I'm going to, that's going to change all of their lives dramatically. I've done my bit versus, you know, I can go back now and I've kind of, I can pat myself on the back for that. And because uh, at the time, Irish were flooding to orphanages all over the world, you know. And, and as have Irish have been for a very long time. Mm. And, uh, but I thought I'd done my job. And at the end of the week, as I was leaving then, um, one little girl who is still very much in my life every single day now, um, she had been badly beaten that week and I kissed her goodbye. And I, she said to me that she had never been kissed before as I kissed her goodbye. And I said to her, well, if nothing else, I'm, I'll come back. And I'll, you know, I'll kiss you and hug you on your birthday if nothing else. So that was my promise initially. And um, I, little did I know that 22 years later, I still couldn't get out of the promise. <laughs> I mean, I, it's a commitment, it was, you know, it was a lifetime commitment, which I did not realize at the time. And what I find extraordinary is, so you came home, you gathered people together. You, I mean, it goes through this in the book, um, and I'm maybe making a hash of this story, right? But you gathered lovely people around you together. There's a great story, actually, if you wouldn't mind telling, of your coffee morning in Clontarf. Tell that story. Um, yeah, so we decided to, you know, at the time, coffee mornings were a thing. Funny, they're kind of not so much now, other than the big one that they do for the hospice, I think. Sure. And uh, so we thought, okay, what do we have? Like, we were your quintessential housewives, kind of. We were in Clontarf. Our kids were all in school. We were meeting in the mornings. What can we do to help these kids? Let's have a coffee morning. It was the solution. Um, there was no, at the time, there was no online donations there was no you know there was none of that stuff going on go fund me pages didn't exist blah blah so it was the coffee morning and uh, so Beulie supplied the coffee at the time we got big huge um flasks of it and everybody was interested in the whole orphan story because the chinese you may be too young to remember this Dara. i'm not sure what age you are but the chinese orphanage story had just been on the tv at the time and it had just, somebody had just done a documentary on it and the little kids were chained to potties and people were really starting to be horrified by the fact that children were living like this. And Irish were going abroad to adopt children in orphanages and so people were getting very interested. We're, we are not an adoption organisation. Um, and so we decided to put the word out. And so we started early in the morning, 10 o'clock, and at a very early stage in the day, we decided to add whiskey to the 
to the coffee, which was really clever because then people really did stay all day and then the pockets got deeper and deeper. So, um, and we charged much more, obviously, for the whiskey and the coffee. Everybody was walking, there was nobody driving. Sure. And uh, so we had a day of Irish coffees rather than a day of coffee. And uh, by 12 o'clock at night, I think we had something in the region of eight or nine grand, which was a lot of money then for like a coffee morning. People were raising hundreds rather than thousands. And that gave us that initial we're we're off we're off you know and then I decided to pick up the phone and ring Pat Kenny on the Saturday night live it was at the time and weirdly Pat Kenny answered the phone because you know the way the researchers are like dragon people Mm. and uh, there's like no way you're going to get through them and uh, so Pat Kenny said to me like I'll put you on for 10 minutes like but like you're nobody absolutely like you've you, you know and but like can you talk are you sure you can hold it together for 10 minutes so I said I swear I'll definitely talk for the 10 minutes and uh, so I went on on a Saturday night and so that really then we really did get momentum then from from that um, the Sunday Independent did a big piece on us afterwards and that followed through then so all of that kind of stuff really got us a brilliant start plus the Celtic Tiger was just born mm. and so people were in the mood to start helping and giving that was just beginning sure and you came home one day to find an envelope on your door do you remember this is this with the name of the charity? Yeah. Um, ah, yes, I did. And a magnificent friend of mine um, had given me a small donation and she had on the name, on the front of the envelope to, to Russia with Love, which we hadn't even really thought about. The, at that stage, we hadn't registered the charity or anything. And she was an incredibly special person and she knew that she would be on the journey with me for a long time. Um, and so when I saw the envelope, I thought, that's it name of we don't have to think about the name of the organization that's it um and of course the movie then is from russia would love the james sure. bond so there was kind of a, t- a tie in there but we were to russia would love because we only had love we would no money like we weren't rich housewives sitting around doing nothing we were all ordinary mammies at the school gate every day and um, some of us working some of us not working but we were ordinary mammies and uh, we didn't have money in our bank accounts that we could afford to just you know we weren't that league mm. um so we had to raise every single with nothing in the bank other, in the beginning other than the coffee morning money and what came in from the pat kenny show and then that kind of that was the beginning of us and one of the things in your book that you talk about is how you've always been very transparent with your money because you don't want to tie into any of the other scandals around charity yeah. just show people We've what been impact that has affected. i mean so and people really do need to look at charities before they give the money and make sure you know so i'm not sure when it, well, about five years ago i can't remember his name but um the daily independent did an art asked rang our office and asked a permission to do a full absolute like forensic examination on us. and i was like completely shitting myself about it because I was thinking they're definitely going to find like something that I did wrong somewhere that I didn't put a receipt. I was thinking, oh my God. But I spoke to the board about it and we said, well, look, let like we've nothing to hide. Um, we've a rigid accountant since day one who we've never paid. And um, he has set up rules for us 20 years ago that we had to adhere to that I absolutely hated. They really killed me at times, but we did stick to them and um, it paid off. So the independent came in and did a full, they... They came in and their accounts, uh, they, they sent in an accounts team and they looked at the, like, they went through our accounts for the previous 10 years. They went through, they used, an, like, they had access to our computers and they went through absolutely every single thing we ever did. I was sweating because I, we've never done anything wrong, but you know the way you'd be thinking, oh my God, what if, you know? But, um, I mean, they then, and we didn't know what they were going to print. Now, I mean, I was really felt ill about us. I mean, we are good, but I was still worried. And they printed a, uh, I just can't remember the guy's name, but he printed a fabulous article um, in the Independent then afterwards to say that he'd gone through absolutely everything. I mean, they looked for things like first class flights. Of course we had none. He was looking for expenses, none of the board drawn expenses. You know, there was nothing. I mean, he, they looked for everything and they couldn't find anything. So we were really delighted with the outcome of that because charities at the time, for a long time in Ireland, have been terribly ungoverned. Sure. You know, and yeah. Yeah, people have to be really wary about where their money's going, you know. And then skipping back, you loaded a truck, if I get this right, and you went to Russia and you decided that, right, I'm going to take this orphanage in Hartlova. Yes. And we're going to do something about it. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, I'd never do that again. We did it once um, because at the time everybody was loading trucks. It was kind of the in thing. 
And uh, so, and it's really easy to get stuff. So like people say to you, I'll give you 10 fridges. I'll give you, you know, 20 chairs that are in the basement. I'll give you, so it's, and like somebody gave us like um, 10 grand's worth of food, peas, beans. So it's easy to get stuff from people. So it's very easy to fill a truck. Um, and then we had a fabulous uh, team driver and uh, they took the truck to Russia. And like, but I mean, the paperwork at the border and all that sort of stuff. Now, it was an amazing experience when it arrived because our orphanage is down a big, long, foresty lane. And this huge truck arrived. The kids had never seen a 40-foot container before because they never leave the orphanages. And of course, we had a gorgeous Irish man driving it. And it was just a 40-foot container of magic. And we had found sponsor families in Ireland for every single child and every single sponsor family made a box with the child's name on it so these children were opening boxes with their own name on it they'd never had a personal possession before with like pink jackets yellow jackets bed linen some of our young mums now 25 years later still have the sheets in packets that we packed in 1998 because they never opened it to this day they have never opened them um, because they were so tre- such a treasure for them to get a present in a packet. Because when you live in an orphanage, everybody's sharing everything. Mm. Your vest is your vest one day. It's somebody else's vest the next day. Yeah. So the truck arrived, and it was definitely a, a magical experience. We photographs of the kids carrying big boxes on their shoulders, going off to the room with their box with their name on it. And it was an amazing thing. I just wouldn't do it again. Because what happens in a situation like that is Western stuff comes in. And in a lot of cases, it goes in the front door and out the back you know, being perfectly truthful. And uh, so you're much better off if you can uh, buy local because no one wants to rob a brown Russian jumper that's new, but they will want to take it if it's from Arnott's. You know what I mean? Because the quality is so, because they they really want Western quality. Well, they did back in 1998. Times have changed. So I I wouldn't do it again. Um, So you went into this orphanage you knocked the locks off the door, which is an amazing image. We did. You did. And one of the things that I want to bring you to is finding out why children were going up into the attic. So you cover that in the book. So will you just give us a little reading of yeah, that, I will. please? Before I do, I, I read that. I'll tell you, we took a group of men with us from a thing called Trade Aid. They all worked for the ESB here. And uh, we had three of them, real tough cookies. They've been all over the world in institutions doing voluntary work. And they were the real deal. Like They were really hard men to crack. Um, and uh, they were scathing of us kind of dopey housewives that wanted to change the world for these children, you know. And they were really nervous of coming on board with us, thinking this shower are never going to get it together. They're all too dreamy. You, Debbie wanted everything pink and I wanted the, every room to be exactly designed by the children themselves and trade aid thinking hold on you're losing the plot here you know but they were tough cookies and John O'Brien was one of them and John Mulligan was another one a brilliant um, humanitarian and still is to this day has done huge work in Romania and uh, but John O'Brien had to kick the locks off those doors because there was too many locked doors um, but they were brilliant men and uh, initially they definitely did I think I think I was accused of being a dumb blonde in the beginning but I'm still great friends with them and I think we went to prove them wrong so um, we had spotted the children going up and down a rickety ladder to this filthy old attic one day I went up to see what they were doing and found a room wedged with an ancient old with ancient old suitcases mostly made out of battered cardboard the children were like mice scrabbling around at their suitcases so I asked what's in this room It turned out that when the children first arrived to the orphanage, they brought with them a suitcase which was taken from them the day they arrived. They could have had an old pair of shoes in the case or possibly a photo of their mother or even a letter from her. These dirty battered old suitcases were treasure trunks for these children, the only link with family life and their earlier lives, but they were just dumped in the attic by staff, one on top of the other in great heaps. It was filthy, freezing and wet up there with water running down the walls and snow falling through a broken roof. And yet these children would spend their time up in that attic, hunting through piles to find their own memories. Clearly these suitcases were just the most precious things in the whole world to them. So when we renovated, we built a suitcase room. Now they all have their own spot on nice white shelves with sliding ladders so they can reach their suitcase themselves. We have tables where they can sit and go through it all. I felt it was very important for them all to be able to do that. 
That, that really just gets me. That just gets me. I know you have an involvement with Barrettstown, and I have an involvement with Barrettstown as well because I volunteered there and worked there and everything. And it just reminds me of that power that children are, are told yes. You know, you, uh, children who have been told no that our whole lives or their whole medical condition are suddenly saying, yes, you can do this. Yes. So it's amazing. We um, have Barrettstown when we, when Bess Lan, which is the, in, in the book, it's, we touched mm. on, but I won't go, it's too long a story, but Bess Lan was the tragedy in the children's school in Russia 16 years ago. And uh, Joe Duffy on RT and myself did a kind of a um, fundraising thing and the Irish people were unbelievably generous. We raised a fortune and we went to Bess Lan and we didn't know what to do with the money there because we felt there was too much negativity and corruption around at the time, which there is when big things happen in the world, like the tsunami and that kind of stuff, you can't control the money. Mm. Um, So we decided to come home to Ireland and we rented Barrettstown uh, for a month and we brought, we flew a plane of um, people in from Beslan that had been left like bullet holes, limbs missing, etc. Daddies that had lost their wives because they'd all, 300 people had died in the school that day. They'd been blown up by terrorists. So yeah, we had Barrettstown Castle to ourselves for a month. It was a fabulous experience just to, that was our tie in at Barrettstown at the time. And speaking of being told no, one of the other stories I love in the book is that at one stage you brought a health official out with you to do a study on this, who came back to your board and said, you guys should leave because you're not going to make an impact here. Yeah, I think I buried that report. Um, I might have, I don't know if it ever got as far as my board, but I think I might have put it in the bin before it ever got to my own board because... The reason I did was because I brought him out in the very beginning. I asked somebody from the authorities here to come out with me and uh, to look at the whole thing because I hadn't a clue. I didn't, no, didn't a notion, hadn't a notion how to change. I knew I have this thing in my head. Some people can do it and some people can't do it, but I know exactly where I want to get. I just don't know how to get there. Right. So other people are much better at the getting there. They might, do you know what I mean? So other people are much better at plotting the journey. I, I don't see any of the challenges on the humps on the journey. I just see the thing at the end of the, of the tunnel. So I knew I wanted, the, I wanted the best children's home in the world, which was so unrealistic, but I knew I wanted it. And I knew I wanted it to be pink and I knew the boys would want it to be blue. I know it sounds very classic and all that, but that was their choice. I wanted white windows I wanted clean beds fluffy towels I wanted to hairdressers for the girls I wanted I wanted all the things that family children have and I wasn't looking for Disneyland I just wanted them to have what family children have so I thought how am I going to get there so my first stop was um I better talk to somebody in the authorities kind of who are involved in institutions and difficult children and foster care and all that kind of thing <laughs> so I brought him with us and uh, he took one look at it. Uh, he spent a week on the ground with me and he ran, wrote back to my board and said, you guys need to you know, go back to your normal lives. You've no chance. There's not enough of you. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough. Uh, you need one-to-one care for this. You don't have enough. You forget about it. You, you can't make an impact on this. I'm not quite sure what happened in that report, but I, it, I certainly, I'm not sure we ever discussed it at a board meeting, but I knew it wasn't what I wanted to hear. So I definitely ignored his recommendations. Um, and I knew I knew I could turn. I knew I, I knew that with the team I had behind me as well that we could turn the ship. And how was dealing with the authorities in Russia? Yeah, everybody asks me that question because obviously everybody is kind of scared of Russia. It's kind of that big scary place full of scary people, and uh, they're kind of real frosty, grumpy looking, you know, people. And um, I, I, it's been a dream. For There's me. a great story that you tell of looking back at old documentaries and old interviews now and realizing that your interpreters at the time weren't actually interpreting what no. you were saying. No, and and, and, not, not, and I, now that I am tuned into what interpreters do, they don't interpret what you're saying. Um, because and they have such a weight of responsibility in their hands because you it's every nuance is really important um, so when I went into my in the beginning I was so horrified at what I saw like the dirt the filth the rats children had rats down their jumpers you'd see a child with something moving on the front of their jumper and the next thing you'd see a pink tail and yeah. the Irish freaked out about that of course. and uh, so when I went to, I, I wanted to see my governor 
governors are the big bosses in Russia, you know, and I, I wanted to, and of course my Russians were all saying to me, oh no, nobody gets to see the governor, like again, a bit like the Wizard of Oz, oh no, the governor's in this big building in the city, and I said, sorry, I need to go to the top about this one, so I went in to see my governor, and I was all emotional and dramatic, and I was all like, it was freezing, snowing, we all had our snow boots on, and all. I said, these children like are living in shit, and I need, we need to do something about this, we can't, and of course my interpreter at the time was, you know, Debbie says that, the conditions aren't very good, but I had no idea. It was only afterwards when I watched back years later, I thought he didn't interpret a bloody line that I said. Um, but the, my governor knew what I was saying, you know, but sure. it, it, interpreters do do that. Sure. I doubt Putin's does because I did use an interpreter Putin and I'd say his gets it pin perfect. But in general, to save my bacon in the beginning, because I was ranting and raving at people high up in authority about conditions. And I really had no right to do that, you know, because um, I was given out about people that hadn't been paid in six months and I was given out about people that were earning, you know, 50 euro a week. Mm. And I was screaming and roaring that the children weren't being properly looked after. And what, you know, these people weren't being looked after themselves, which I didn't know at the time. And you do go into the book in that you do say that it wasn't that the staff didn't care about the children. It's just that they weren't equipped enough to care in no, ways. you see orphanages are in villages so in villages you've got village staff you've got village people you know you've you haven't got highly trained um pediatricians or uh, at the time there was no social no social workers in russia it didn't exist as a university degree so you haven't got an under you had educational psychologists because in russia everything's about education so we could assess the children as to where they were on a, on a scale of one to ten but you wouldn't be assessing them on their heartache their trauma their any of that it was purely you know academic like a child would come in um be taken off their mother on a monday tra- absolutely traumatized and come into the orphanage and like on tuesday morning they do an academic uh, exam to see what number they are and if they're seven they go to one orphanage which is for sevens and if they're an eight they go to orphanages for eights so everything's completely graded on your academic ability which we stopped we didn't allow it happen and we stopped a lot of things because I mean, you asked me a minute ago about Russians. I mean, they have been, I mean, I don't say this because I need a visa. I have a multiple entry visa. Um, And also, I'm not the sort of person that I'm not going to kiss ass for the sake of it. If I really was unhappy with something, I would say it about somebody. They have been unbelievable to us for 22 years. And I mean, the one thing I would say that they did for me, which was, which is unusual for Russians is trust us. Because they're untrusting of Westerners because invariably Westerners are criticizing them or, you know, and they're nervous of, there's a general, that frosty air all the time. Um, And I mean, they let us in anywhere we wanted to go. And like, we didn't do that in Ireland. No, when anybody knocked on the door of our orphanages in Ireland, nobody let them in. Those children behind the walls of Arte and Boys School and of Letter of Frack, nobody was let in there. No outside person came into those places to see the bruises and the beatings and the rapes and all the rest of it. The Russians gave me a green light to go anywhere I wanted to go and see any room I wanted to get into. And I still to this day am surprised they did that with us. But we're not a political organization and we're not religious. So we were very non-threatening. I wasn't out there as an advocate to change the way Putin feels about anything. We were out there to look after children. And I think they felt very unthreatened by that. They were amazing to us. Let's have a look at some of your photos from the last 22 years. Thank you very much to Lisa on your team. And uh, one of the things that I love about the book as well is you keep on going back to the wonderful people that you work with. So this isn't just the Debbie Deegan show. It's no. you and Lisa and like so many we other people. Have, like, uh, Lisa's on the end of a computer. I, I try not to be. So she does all that lovely. And also she's obsessed with the proper spelling and I'm the complete opposite with full stops and commas. If you've got an email from me, there's rarely a full stop or a comma in it. Uh, which they all it drives them nuts in the organization. But um, so, yeah, I'm surrounded by people that are constantly um, working for nothing for children. So I'm the one, they send me out to do the talking, but the rest of them like, are, do, are working constantly. We're very, very committed, passionate bunch of people. This is kind of a mixed match of photos. So we're going to jump a little bit from story to story. But actually, there's the statistics for the um, effect. Yes. Uh, two children with love have. I okay. really am so overwhelmed by the successfully integrate into society one. 
Yeah, they that um, one of our board members did that actually a couple of, I think about three years ago for a ladies' lunch we were having, and I just saw it the other day and thought it'll give you a good picture mm. um, of where we're at. You know, in general, there are statistics around orphan children, orphan boys particularly end up back in prisons, etc. There's huge statistics around that. They're drawn back into drugs. They're drawn back into institutions for an orphan boy to leave an orphanage at 17 or 18 and to go back into prison wouldn't be that big a step because the prisons aren't that much different to the orphanages really so it's nearly like it's not that big a di- so 90 percent of them at the time were going back into prisons they had no future at all none at all um and so intervention makes a difference and we i you know i'm not sure looking back on it i'm not sure if I was starting all over again, you need to you need to have like nuclear energy, literally, because it was 20 years of intervention that made a difference with our lot. I'm not sure we could ever repeat this project, you know, to the same level, mm. because we took children who were six and seven years of age in 1997, 1998, and we're still with them. It's tw- and it's 2020. We're still with the same children. So it's it's it was uh, very few organizations can say that. You know, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying it's what we did. Sure. If, I, if I was to do it again, would I would I do it like that? Probably not, because it's because there's no getting out of it, because we're now we're in it for life. Those children, no matter what happens to them in their life now, contact us. My phone, my Instagram, my um, Facebook is constant messages, um, because they've had a baby, they're in trouble, they're uh, something. They have a boyfriend. They've well, and, and initially it was a hundred children, two hundred children, three hundred children. So when you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them coming through to you all the time with their problems, it's quite unsustainable. But it's how we set it up and it's what's made the difference. And that's why you see those statistics, because the children felt they were part of a huge family. Sure. And the book actually does tell their stories in a re- in a really, I'm not going to say positive way, but a really realistic way as well. And a hopeful way, actually, yes. um, from many of them. Yes. Which is which is great. Yes. Who is this? So he is a book in himself, right. is, what, is what he is. Um, that. that magnificent uh, male specimen there is a guy called Kirill Cherepanov. And Kirill, actually, I just, I didn't realize, but actually when I opened this book today, um, I just opened it on the first page there. And that's him oh, okay. as, a, as a baby, I as a six-year-old. Yes, and yeah. identity because, I mean, look at his face. Like, when we came in, it was like, oh my God, go away, you annoying you know, bouncy, happy people. He just couldn't bear us. Mm. And he was a near, I won't say nearly a twin, but his brother was like very close in age, like maybe 10 months in the difference. Uh, uh, also beautiful face, but better natured. Kirill was the dark one and the brother was lighter and brighter. And Americans at the time were coming in to adopt and Americans loved the cutest puppy in the litter syndrome i don't mean to sound disrespectful but I, they are the bouncy cute ones were with the pigtails were the ones that got mm. adopted and so Kiria looked at every adopter with that face like go and you know swing your hook i you know don't adopt me thanks very much you're all right um so his brother was taken to america which nearly killed Kiria at the time and to this day it still nearly kills him but anyway it's an it's an amazing story really anyway to make a long story short Kiria was a very difficult uh, boy and the Irish loved him I think because we put volunteers living out there for 12 years and because he was such a because he he just didn't trust Russians only because he didn't trust anybody right um, and the Irish were more tolerant of him because he was bold I mean if he could be bold he was as bold as he could possibly be um, difficult natured stormy personality very moody <laughs> he knows I say all this I'm not saying anything I wouldn't say to him or I have said to him in the past and uh, so we became quite close and we started um, we, we built a big relationship with him and his mom um, left him and she wrote to him maybe every two or three years to say she was coming on a certain day in May to come and collect him. And we used to wait at the gate for her to come and she never did come. And it, his heart was smashed into smithereens and he trusted absolutely nobody on our, on this earth. Um, my daughter Sophie was uh, went out there for her transition year and uh, himself and herself had a huge relationship. But they was, they're still very extremely close, the pair of them. And um, so he trusted Sophie and he started to trust the Irish. And then he came to live with us for a while and he came to live in, our, in Cork for a while and he was extremely difficult here and he ended up going back. And um, so 
when he left, I really thought he's going to end up with a knife in between his shoulder blades. He's going to go to prison. He because he looks for people to hate him. He seeks out people that are going to fight with him and hate him. And um, he's a magnificent heart of gold. Anyway, last year he came into Clontarf Castle. That's where that is. And he made a speech at our ball. And he speaks English beautifully. And he made a speech at our ball and a magnificent speech about the fact that his mother had thrown him away and that the Irish were his family. And um, we all sat looking at him in his tuxedo. And of course, like, just magnificent young man. And he's a panel beater, brilliant panel beater. And in the meantime, then, I did a trawl of Facebook that took me years. And I eventually found this really good looking, uh, nearly identical twin to him, very similar face, lying on the deck of a yacht in New England um, in a posh yacht club. So I rang the yacht club, make a long story short, I found the brother. And um, it was like, talk about like rich man, poor man scenario. But anyway, I won't really go into that story, but very wealthy family, very privileged life. And uh, I think he wrote to Kiriel and we, I, anyway, we joined the pair of them because Kiriel was mad keen for about 10 years to try and find him. And in the first kind of two or three months, Kiriel very, really doesn't trust anybody. So the brother sent him a picture of a, brand new red Hummer that he'd gotten from Santa Claus, like a real one, right. not a toy one. And Kiriel was living in like one room in a hostel at this stage. So Kiriel kind of thought, look, you know what? I don't want you in my life. Kiriel got said, he's real stubborn, unbelievably difficult, stubborn person. And if Kiriel decides not to talk to you, he'll never talk to you again. So he decided to cut the brother out of his life, which since has turned around, I might add. But he came to stay with us then over Christmas and we bought him a red kite uh, from Santa Claus. He was about 23 at the time. And um, so Santa still, I'm, we're very much a Santa household. So Santa came and um, Santa brought Kiriel a red kite and we went down to Dollymount Beach on Christmas morning and he just, like he was three or four hours on Dollymount Beach of this red kite. He had never had a kite before. It was just the freedom of Dollymount Beach on Christmas morning. Like I was panicking because the turkey was in the oven. <laughs> and uh, so my husband has had a big influence on him. My whole family have, the Irish in general have. He had a beautiful family in Cork who loved him dearly for a long, long time. Um, and he rang me last week to say, I have news. I said, and I say to him all the time, yeah, yellow blue, which is, I love you. He'll never, ever say it back to me. And uh, so he said, I have news. I said, Kirill, don't tell me you've got, like, what is the, like, you know, what's the news? And he said, well, I just got married that day last week oh. to a magnificent girl called Diana, who I know because he's introduced me to all his previous girlfriends to see whether I like them. <laughs> and she's pregnant on June and December and he's going to have a little girl. And I just can't believe he's just, because he, I don't mean he shouldn't be alive, but the chances of him surviving were really slim. Sure. You know, special, special person. And there's so many more stories. Oh like my God, that. he's one. No, I have yeah. thousands. There's Diana there now, and yeah. his hand on her on her baby. I mean, just if you knew this boy, he's just extraordinarily difficult person. Who and he knows I say that about him all the time, but he's got a heart of gold. He just doesn't let anybody into his heart right. ever. So this girl has broken down that barrier. She's the first one to do it. So yeah, I mean, we set out about you know we really did decide in the beginning we wanted to change lives. You're not going to do that by going in and making a donation and getting out of there. You sure. have, you really have to give your life to it, you know? Okay. Um, there he is on Dolly Mount Beach with my, our two dogs. Very good. This one. Well, that's uh, a, a child on the left. Um, the boy on the left works for us, Sajid Zakanov. Um, his story actually is in the book as well. Mm. And he raised his two sisters in the orphanage. And he ne he was, he's been working for us for the last five years since he left the orphanage. He's a great boy. Um, he's now works with children all of the time. And uh, that's just one of our children. Again, a real trust photograph because the kids don't trust people. Sure. So even jumping into somebody's arms like that would be a big thing. Like we've millions of things like that that go on all the time that you would not even consider with your own children. But for us, there would be things that we have to do that get the children to build a trust with us all the time, you know? It Unconditional. Bro it broke my heart, Debbie, to read in the book and to hear you speaking at the TED Talk about the phrase, you are beautiful. Yeah, that's right, actually. Ted ho honed in on that. Tiprikrasna, it is in Russian. And when we went to the beginning, in Russia, uh, they don't tell children they're beautiful, in general. Um, you're judged on your academic ability. And we're gushers here about, oh my God, you look gorgeous. Oh, you're just a dote. Oh my God, your hair is gorgeous today. And the Irish are really like that. 
um, the Russians would not be like that. They're, they raise their children in a different way. They're more disciplined. They would think we're very undisciplined. Um, so when we went in first, um, I had a little girl. Actually, I told the story about it, but um, she had syphilis and she was only about 13, I think, at the time. And uh, I went over and sat down beside her and they put the children with syphilis at red plates because there were different color plates to everybody else's plate. This is going back then to 1998, back in the dark, really dark days. Mm. And I sat down beside her and I said to her, I wanted to be her friend because nobody else would befriend her because they knew she had a disease. And I said to her, I learned those words, you are beautiful, because she's beautiful hair and beautiful eyes. And like nobody would say that to her because she was like contaminated one, you know. And so we learned how to say it. So then after that, all the Irish learned how to say it. And we like, we're, we're really crap at Russian. And uh, all of us together, thankfully, we're all as bad as each other. And uh, but we, we've learned key words and they're words that are really important to us. So Thibri Krasna is you are beautiful. Just powerful. Um, stop me at any of the photos that you would like to talk about because there's so many here and so many stories we could Just be for ages. There one. Just go, go back to there one. That's fun. a quick one there that I'll yeah. tell you. It's really a random thing. See that bunch of kids there? They mm. are from Hong Kong. And last year they asked me to go and meet them in Moscow because they all wanted to talk about freedom, philanthropy, changing lives. They're all brilliant students, all doing like different PhDs, mathematics, all this. They'd come from Hong Kong and they were on, a, on like hitting three or four countries along the way, looking at how to make social change. Three months later, Hong Kong was in chaos. And one of them emailed me since then to say, um, we're in chaos, we're all, because these were the actual students that were on the streets of Hong Kong that were out protesting. I've no idea where any of them are today, but we went and met them in Moscow and they were like overwhelmed by our story that you, like, not, not that a small team of people can make change because in their world, that can't happen. Mm. So they're trying, they were trying to learn how do you make social change? So that's what that was about. It was an amazing day. They're all brilliant, brilliant, brilliant um, Hong Kong students. I don't know where they are today. There's himself. There's himself. Now, we know from the video at the start that you met him and you got the highest honour awarded to a Westerner from Russia, which is kind of like you're a friend of Russia. Yes, it's the order of friendship. It goes to about three or four people a year to Westerners. And um, yeah, it's an amazing ceremony that I was really not quite prepared for the amazingness of it <laughs> because my world was just always having him on a picture on the wall and sure. I always stayed away from him because I kind of thought, you know, He's a bit scary and I don't need politics. I don't need yeah. politics. And also in Russia, you don't get involved in politics because they have all sorts of complicated issues around charities and politics and all that. So we're not advocates. We're not there for political reasons. We're there to, we're babysitters. We're there to raise children with really good Russian people. So I didn't need him in my life. Um, but I got a phone call in Ireland uh, one day. My daughter was getting married um, in November and I got a phone call from the Kremlin. And I was driving the car. I thought, Jesus, I pulled over beside the canal. And uh, I said, yes, this is Mrs. Deegan. <laughs> is that Mrs. Deegan? This is the Kremlin calling. Like, how often ever does anybody ever say anything about that? So you're kind of thinking, is there somebody joking? Because you know the way people sure. will be joking you all the time uh, about stuff like that, you know? And uh, so they said, you've been invited to be, um, this ceremony and um, you're going to be awarded with. And I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. And then I thought, now the only thing is, I said, I think I could be busy that day because my daughter's getting married the day before. Like, not that I'm washing my hair or anything, but just my, it's actually my daughter's wedding. Mm. So we were in Connemara for the wedding the day before and myself and Patricia, who has been involved with me for 20 years, Patricia McGrath, the two of us then the next day, legs it out of Connemara, straight onto a plane, straight to Moscow. Met at the airport by this like stunning blonde from a James Bond movie, literally, with her magnificent fur hat and her magnificent, you know, everything. And a big car sent from the Kremlin to meet us. Blue flashing lights. Stayed in uh, Putin's own hotel that night, the presidential hotel, like totally formidable, unbelievably formidable, you know. And everybody had said in advance, like, just be careful in the rooms. No point in, you know, just be careful what you say. Be careful what you, you kind of think the KGB are watching every move. And, um, but beautiful uh, old Soviet hotel in the middle of Moscow. Then the next morning, cavalcade arrives straight through the streets of Moscow. All the cars get out of your way because they know it's a presidential cavalcade in through the gates of the Kremlin. Like it's mental, you know, and uh, we went in and uh, up this like staircase that Cinderella kind of would go up and all these soldiers all standing either side. Like it's mad for, you know, 
yeah. we're very ordinary people. We're not used to this kind of thing. Sure. And uh, then you're waiting in this ante room and there's kind of nice pod tables and you're having your little drinks. And I thought, well, this is nice. They're going to kind of, there'll be a stage kind of. The next thing, these two, absolutely. Now, when I tell you, they must be 25 foot high golden doors open. And Trisha, I said, Trish, Jesus Christ, the doors are opening. The doors open into this gold room. There was a picture of it there earlier. I saw it on the screen. It's literally a gold room. And uh, there was about 20 or 30, there's about 800 people, 20 or 30 pot round tables. Orchestras playing. There's 200 children with violins. There was ballerinas. It was like off the scale. I mean, when Russians organize something, it is off the scale. It's not like... Like the last conference I was there for women, they beamed two female astronauts onto the stage to talk to us. Wow. Like, I mean, their conferences are off the scale. So I went into the room. This man came over. Am I talking too much? Yeah, go on. This man came over, took me by the arm, brought me up to the top table. And Trisha was sitting back at a table three or four. And I was wondering why we were being separated. And there was a place empty beside me. I could see the, there was about four or eight of us at the table. Right. And I wasn't thinking, any, and then they said to me, the Russian Pope's going to be sitting to your left. And I was thinking, holy divine Jesus, what am I going to talk to a Pope about? Because I'm not a bit religious. Sure. And um, like, so I thought, okay, okay, the Pope, the Pope, Pope, long beard, big heavy man, giant, you know, the jewels and the hat and the diamonds. And I was thinking, if I only had his hat, I'd never have to fundraise again. That's mm-hmm. what I was thinking. So with that, then I get a tip on the shoulder from obviously FSB, security, to say Mrs. Deegan, the president of Russia is going to be sitting to your right. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. And I brought my phone. I wasn't supposed to. My mother told me afterwards, it says on the invitation, no phones. Right. So I text Mammy and said, Mammy, you're not going to believe this, but I'm Putin is sitting to my right. Mammy said, what are you going to say to him? Here she's texting me back. I'm under the table at the ground. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to say to him. Like, you can't say ordinary things. Like, I was thinking, do you say to him, like, do you have a dog? Or You don't say you were beautiful to the person. Where are you going on holidays? Or what? Like, you know, have you been to her a clue? Like, do you know what I mean? So anyway, he sat down beside me. And so I had the president on my right. I the Pope on my left. I mean, hello. T- intimidating dinner party, you know, wow. chat. But I have to say, he total pro. I mean, he was pleasant, charming. He speaks four or five languages. He knew all the Irish poets. There's nothing the guy doesn't know. I mean, they're, he's so intelligent, so educated. You know, he, so he made it easy for me. But I think I spoke to him for longer than probably most people have. I He had me for two and a half hours. And one of the things that you said is you really want him... No, you want to be by his side when he closes the gate on the last orphanage in Russia. Yes. So he invited me up onto the stage to make a speech, which I hadn't prepared. And uh, I think there was, was there 600 million people uh, uh, watching it? Sure, yeah. And is that right, figure? Something like half of Russia basically watched this whole show, this enormous thing. And I kind of thought, well, no, I haven't really prepared for this. But I, I you know, I, 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 he was standing beside me and he stands ramrod straight and um, so I said, look, I said, I just need, we need to close orphan, the last of the orphanages, which he knows they are working on that. And I had to say to him, I hope I'm here when we're doing this, because I've been here for 22 years doing it, you know, and I wanted the message to be clear that we need to close them. And I want to be there when I see the last one closed. And, um, and I wanted to compliment him on how, how in, unbelievable Russia has been to us for 22 years. Really unbelievable to us. We're going to fly through the rest of these. You did a TEDx talk, which people can watch on YouTube. Yes, I um, please watch it. It's you're now to Children with Love. Let's have a very quick talk about the changing of the name. Yeah. So it's not to Russia with Love anymore. It's, it's to not. Children with Love. And the reason being that about five years ago, um, an, an Irish um, woman approached me who was the principal of a school about taking on a project here. And we had never really looked at Ireland because so many people help at home, really so many. There's, there's charities here for everything. So we never really looked at Ireland. And I, we looked at the, a project and um, we had somebody interested in funding a project here that they knew our work in Russia. So uh, a wonderful man um, who had a business quite close to this school, um, a Desh band one school. So children with a lot of challenges in their lives, let's just say. But they have mummies and daddies which was different for us because we're used to children with no mommies and daddies. So we looked at the project, we got involved, and then we got sucked in. Um, and so we couldn't call ourselves to Russia with Love anymore because we were here in Ireland as well with a very similar program in some ways, a scholarship program to the scholarship program we were running in Russia. Very, very similar. 
and uh, so we changed the name of the organization to children with love and the scholarship program has lovely results as well we results yeah. yeah i mean the school obviously we're working with teachers and a great principal amazing teachers that work with deaf children i mean i take my hat off to them and i mean those schools can be very chaotic children come from a lot of chaos in those, a lot of those homes um, so yeah, when we started in the beginning, um, the school was really turning turning a corner, and um, so we got involved, and a huge team of us put our backs behind. Uh, at the time, really, when we began, the children weren't doing CAOs, um, and we weren't really sure why. And then we discovered it was because they cost like fifty or sixty quid, and they, they, their parents might have seen the value in that because a lot of their parents didn't go to universities or ever finish school. In fact, a lot of their parents would have had bad feelings about school. Um, so we set up a CAO thing and helped the children through it. And so they've been going to colleges. So last week uh, we got our results. And so all of the children that are on our scholarship program are now going to university. One is going to be a doctor. Um, he missed doctor by about six points, but he got so uh, biochemistry and Trinity, but he will go into medicine next year. Um, wow. And we've got all of the children went to colleges and universities. So yeah, it's been a real success story. Congratulations! Thank you very much. It's called the Rising Tide program. The Rising Tide, yeah. and people can find out more about it on yes, our, on our website. website. Yeah, um, I'm flying through these images. Yeah, I mean they all they're all magnificent stories. It's interesting yes. to fly through them. But I mean, you can't I, and, tell and, all the stories. I know, and it is one of those things. That's my our little girl Sasha, who was the very first child that I kissed in the orphanage and told her I'd come back. And she has uh, actually, when I read, I just read the book earlier sitting here mm. and in it, she's a waitress, but now she actually works for us. And um, she was living with me last year, but she'd gone through some very personal crisis in Russia. And uh, she had just horrible boyfriend who did horrible things. And then he released tapes, you know, the way they can oh, put the God. tapes out there. And so we took her to Ireland for a year to try and recover from physical, emotional sexual everything damage in every direction so she came to live with us for a year and she turned it she's the most magnificent girl as you can see from her face there sure. and uh, so now she's works for us and i'd i'd be scared if i was one of the children working on because she she just takes no shit because she was raised in an orphanage so she's working now with our children who leave the orphanage Brilliant. so when they tell me they need something she'll say Sir, she'll ring me that night and say actually you know what she doesn't need that you know she's put chance in her arm so she runs the rules the roost for us at the moment and she's a dynamo Brilliant. She came on the stage at the end of TED. I brought her with me because it's, it's her story. Sure. So she walked down at the end. She was absolutely shitting herself coming on the stage because it wouldn't be her thing at all. But I, she was the first kiss and that's the truth of the story. Um, and now she's raised, now she's running her organization in Russia for us and she's a brilliant girl. So she should have been on a TED, the stage of TED with me. Isn't that incredible? Some, I, I got very emotional going through the book and looking at some of these photos. Um, some, because I'm adopted, so I know what it's, I don't know what it's like to be in a Russian orphanage, obviously. And I wasn't in an Irish orphanage. I was born in a mother and baby home and I moved quickly to my parents in the 1970s. I think I was a year and a half old, but it is always that thing about separation. And it's always that thing about being away from the people. And you, you mentioned this in the book a lot. It, it's, it, it was Russian society at the time. That was as bad almost as Irish society at the time was at the church influence. We didn't have the church stuff. influence. Yeah, similar. I mean, the, I, I, I fight with people over this. Uh, at, uh, we have a, Joanna Fortune is a psychotherapist who ran our organization at one stage. She's a great psychotherapist. She's always on the radio and telly is here. And um, I would always talk to her about attachment issues because I would, I, I'm not sure your heart ever fully heals is what I would think. Um, I just am not sure that with all the therapy in the world, I'm, I'm no disrespect to your own situation, but some people obviously come through this and they have a fabulous life. But with our children in Russia, you know, I see, I see them, I've seen them now over 25 years nearly, and I see the pain that they still feel because their mother about rejected them when they were three or four. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, this is, this is my own personal experience. And definitely, I, you know, I don't have the science behind this one, but the children in Russia, are quite balanced, are probably more balanced than a lot of the children I've seen in the West adopted be by families, because in Russia, they're normal, they're part of, they're, they're more like them. Whereas when they're plucked out and sent to America to live in a family home, that's like six bedrooms and they've all got beautiful cars and beautiful lives, a lot of them fail because they're not able to 
be the person that that family expect them to be. So um, we have a lot of stories that I, that I could sit here all day and tell you about um, of children whose adoptions have failed in the West, whereas the children that's remained in Russia actually in their own environment, in a family situation, being our organization or other, similar, um, did better, you know? Not all, but in a lot of cases. That's so I would have surprising. a big opinion on that kind of thing. Uh, again, lots of lovely ones. Some of the beds, I love the stories of the beds, just replacing those big industrial... Oh, we got rid of all the steel ones. We got rid of all that. Yeah, we've got rid of all that shit. All of this, look at that. We have one baby orphanage that we work in and she has a lot of sick babies. I think that that baby, actually, that's about three years ago, I went, I was with Mary Kennedy on a trip and um, I, that was an AIDS baby. Um, so it would have been taken from a, mo- a mom with AIDS. And so that orphanage that we work in is at the most beautiful place run by a beautiful woman, doctor, and it's a joy for us to go there. But just when you hold them in your hand like that, it's like you just wonder where they're going to where because adoption has stopped Russia, you sure. know. So there was a time there was a funnel of them going out mm. the whole time. Um, and that funnel has stopped now. So it's you just wonder what's ahead for those children. Debbie, know? how do you how, I mean, looking at how do you do this? How do you how do you keep going, even though like 22 years on, you're still seeing problems, you're still seeing challenges, you're still having to face the fact that children don't have love or aren't told that they're beautiful or whatever. What is it in you, do you think, and all the people that you work with that keeps you going? Um, the, well, the sort of people that run our organization um, are so committed and such like, I mean, I don't think we've lost maybe two people or three people over the years we've lost, but like with the same board for 10 years, which now you'd say is a bad thing, but we've got amazing people that just completely bought into the concept that we were going to become a fa- nearly a giant family to these children. It was nearly an impossible thing to do. Mm. Um, and because of the t- nature that we all are, like we text each other, WhatsApp each other at 12 o'clock at night. It's nonstop. Um, it starts at five. I start early in the morning because I'm in general, I'm on Russian time. So I'd be on to Russia at five o'clock in the morning. So by nine o'clock in the morning, I've kind of got my three hours done with Russia so I can start my Irish day. Sure. Um, but we're all very, we're just commitment. And what is that word? Relentless, relentless, um, dedication and like we really have it's like we found our purpose without sounding cheesy but you know the book sure. um, I think that magnificent man wrote it uh, that died recently Ken the most watched man ever on the TED talk Ken Robinson oh yes I think he wrote right. a book called Finding Your Purpose He's right. a, it's a magnificent TED talk sure. he, he did about children mm. and um, I think it was him that wrote the book and if you can find your purpose in life like I mean it is so true like I have never had I don't I don't suffer with depression right and so I, it, it anyway but and I'm lucky that I don't I have no mental health issues that I know of personally but but we're totally driven by the kids and um, it's so worthy and so worthwhile and when you know that every single thing you go to do it's going to make a difference in a child's life um it just it just lights our fires and sure. we're all the same type of people in the organization we're all lit up by it you'd never at three o'clock in the morning if we needed to talk to one another we would be talking to one another it's um i could sit here all day and ask you tell me about this tell me about that Time, yeah, which looks it's like incredible. it's a 20 year story, Dara. You know what I mean? Like, I'm giving it to you in a very short synopsis. It's a 20 year story. Mm. I mean, okay, Putin was like a fun bit of it and all that, but like, sure. it's been so he was a very like it was a highlight, obviously. But mm. he's I had much more highlights with the with moments with the children, of course. You know, um, we took Brown Bag out at one point, which I know you know, and mm. we, they made a guy called Damien O'Connor genius. Uh, unbelievably difficult personality. He was so hard to crack in the beginning, like it took me at least two hours to crack him. And um, he was just, no way was he going to rush in. No way was he interested in the charity. No way was he going to make me a film. And I wanted this, I wanted a beautiful cartoon made. And I had this vision. I had no idea of the work that went into a cartoon. I thought he might do it in like a weekend. It took him, I think, a year and a half. Um, and so in the beginning, he was like, sorry, no, go away. No, sorry, not interested. Don't do that kind of thing. You have no idea. No, 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 on the phone. And uh, I don't know how many notes he gave me. And then eventually, um, I, he just, I broke him. Nice. And uh, he is, he's, he's a hilarious character. He's brilliant, brilliant, genius mind. He sees the world through different eyes. Um, and he made a magnificent uh, form. We will link to the yeah, story did. in, in yeah. this. Um, 
there's a little video. It's oh. the last slide, actually, which is a bit emotional. Let's go back to that one for a moment. Um, I want to ask you, um, I want to give you a bit of a spiel first, but I want to ask you a question. So as part of what we're doing here in Epic, the Irish Immigration Museum, we have been looking for the stories of epic Irish people all over the world who during the pandemic have come together to kind of go, right, I'm going to do something for my my local area, for my right. community, for my parish, for wherever. Who are the Irish people around the world that are inspiring you? Um, Irish people. Or people generally. Like who are the people that inspire you? Because you, you mentioned you mentioned at the start of this book, you mentioned at the start of this talk, you read a lot. I I used to. Um, I'm not sure that I read a lot now. Um, I think I've turned into like if it's not if I don't see it in front of my face now, it's like I don't find time to read books the way I used to. Um, I mean, I think I just finished uh, Where the Claw Dogs Sing and I think it came out last year. So it took me a year to get to it. Right. Now, it was magnificent. If you haven't read it, it's, it's magnificent. And, um, but, and I just ordered Michael Harding's book last week because I heard him on with Brendan O'Connor. Oh, Michael's and, amazing, yeah. Uh, I just, when I, every single word he, when he said, we're living in paradise, I thought, you know, you're dead, right? Because I had just watched The Octopus Teacher uh, if you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. It's this okay. documentary. It is just the most beautiful documentary. And about, all about nature, this man that falls in love with this octopus under the sea. It's a true story. And um, I was just fascinated by it. So I've, I've, I think with lockdown, I was reading less. I was, th I think I was doing what everybody was doing, was which watching bloody Netflix more and more. Um, so... In people, so at the beginning of lockdown, I was terrified of being bored. I have a fear of being bored, so I started this thing called DDPK, which was Debbie Deacon's Pink Kitchen because right. I have a pink kitchen. And uh, so I was sitting up every morning, and um, it gave me reason to get up, get out of my pajamas because I had no real reason to get out of my pajamas in the morning. I needed to have things to do, okay, I, or else I get bored very quickly. Okay, so I started this mad thing where I was interviewing people, kind of all over. it was like my own TV channel in my head. So I was thinking, who do I want to talk to? So I, and because of Zoom, you can talk to anybody, really. So I did talk to people all over the world, actually. Um, that everybody from Mary McAleese to oh yeah, to, yeah, exactly. amazing, you yeah, know about some it. of them, yeah. So, um, so yeah, Mary McAleese was a powerhouse. Uh, she's unbelievable. I mean, the woman is off. The, she's unbelievable. She's so much energy and she's so positive and she's so dynamic. Um, and so I, Mary, Mac Mary Kennedy is another beautiful person with a, a so, heart of gold, uh, a really, really good person that never doesn't expect, like she'll do anything you ask her to do. Mm. Um, you can't always get celebrities to do that, but they, Mary is one of them. Brandon O'Connor is another one that would never let me down. Yeah. Um, they always say, and then I got reached out. The Black Lives Matter came in, kicked in in the middle of it. And Jerome Westbrooks lives in, in Rohini. He's a magnificent black um, basketball player. And actually, I brought him to the orphanage 15 years ago, and the children had never seen black skin before. It was hilarious mm. because he got out of a ladder and he's like six foot six with dreadlocks in the middle of a forest in Russia. And like they were pulling his shorts up to see to the black all the way up. Like they'd no idea of black skin. And they were looking at his hands, the size of his huge basketball hands, you know. He's a magnificent person. And um, so I spoke to himself and Ed Randolph on DDPK. Ed's son is the goalie for Ireland, I think. Sure. Um, and um, and I spoke to them, and like in that shameful white way that like, what do we say? The, this was when they had just, um, it was the, the knee on the neck thing had just happened and all that drama. Yes. And I wanted to talk to them about how they felt about it as black people living in Ireland and the, how ignorant we all are about the way we handle the situation. Sure. And so they, uh, Jerome would be a definite inspiration to me. He's a very spiritual person and he came with us years ago. He's such a good person. Um, and then I, I did speak to people all over the world that I would really admire um, I spoke to people in Sweden I spoke to somebody in New Zealand who runs a wonderful children's charity there I got her on Zoom and spoke to her I, lo I loved what her charity does over there and so people were very willing because people were locked down and mm. so people were very willing to talk to me um, and yeah I mean there's Ir Irish people are amazing kind, wonderful but there's fabulous people all over the world doing amazing work you know and one of the things that I love and uh somebody who's sitting right opposite me has a bit of a smile at this, but libraries really bring that out. So tell me, did you bring books to Russia? Have, have Russian children been reading Irish oh, authors, Irish books? Yes. Have you been like teaching all the children how to read? I have, a, we have an Irish library in our town actually, um, which is hilarious. And the last book that I brought there 
was only recently I brought, oh no, I brought the photograph of myself with Putin. <laughs> oh my God, right. it's on the shelf. But actually, Jerry McCarthy um, lives in Moscow and he's a brilliant writer and a poet. And he wrote a beautiful book uh, last year on Ireland right. in Russian. Nice. A, and I brought his book down to them. Um, but there's a huge library in my town in Russia and we have an Irish corner in it. And I'm totally jealous of the American corner because it's huge and our nice. corner is small because I don't, but the Americans gave them loads of books. But we have like uh, Marion Key's books and Nevin McGuire's cookbooks and all sure. that kind of stuff. Yes, of course, we have Irish books. The, the orphanage is full of, was full of Irish fairy tales, the children of Lear, all those kind of stories. Nice. And of course, uh, I won't even go into the story of Esalen, but when the tragedy happened, thousands of Irish books were delivered to the Russian embassy here and we decided uh, people made condolence books and we decided to carry them to Beslan and put them on the graves of the children wow. so we took those books from here and the, the documentary was actually called the, the journey of the books so that was another pile of Irish books that went so yeah I nice. was, yes before I play this video that will make a lot of people cry um, Debbie thank you very much for your time we could have talked for ages I know I'm right and, and, so and we were supposed to be doing this in front of a live audience yes. so maybe we can again I think we should if, if people if yes. people can and when if the Red Line Book the Festival say back to normal listen we'll have you back yes if we pass the test if we pass the test okay. uh, remember to keep an eye on the Red Line Book Festival because they will have events throughout the year as South Dublin can libraries do and do support your local library they're an amazing resource Debbie thanks so much not at all I, that was you. a pleasure and I was telling you earlier I have the book highlighted <laughs> I, to go, you I, want to be, I want to ask you about this and this and this and this and this, and this. <laughs> thank you very much and if anybody wants to help us of course I have yes. to say that it's my job to do no, that no, but that, I mean www.tochildrenwithlove to tochildrenwithlove.ie and we need I mean we need funds we can't do what we do without funds I mean it's Absolutely. lovely to, for people to give us stuff but like we do look after children and change their lives. You don't do it. Unfortunately, you don't do it without, without funding. So people's money is well spent with us and anybody will, will know that that's involved in our organization. But before you give to any charity, do look at it and make sure you know where your money's going. It's a, it's a great way to end. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very we much. We will see you again. Thank Please you. God. Uh, Mark from South Dublin County Libraries and everybody who's involved in Redline Book Festival and Box Room, thank you so much. Damien from the Epic Team, Doug Patch and everybody in this 200-year-old building, thank you. Let's have a little cry. When you love someone but it goes to waste Could it be worse? Lights will guide you home and ignite your bones, and I will try to fix
that's where 